Hey everyone, we want to welcome you to this online worship service. Um, we're coming to you from the sanctuary of Drayton Reformed Church. Uh, myself, Pastor Duane, and Pastor Daniel, uh, pastors here at Drayton Reformed Church, we want to welcome you. Uh, it looks like we're going to be worshiping together like this for the foreseeable future uh, as we wait patiently for any word uh, that we can gather again which we are praying will be sooner than later. In the meantime, uh, we are certainly blessed to be able to make use of God's gift of technology. And this is a pretty amazing way that we can do this, which provides us uh, means, uh, the means to be able to be still connected somewhat. Well, we trust you are doing well. Whatever you're doing, as you're watching uh, this video, whatever you've done this weekend, we, we just trust that you have had a good time together as family um, in this time of social distancing. Pastor Daniel and I would strongly, uh, want to strongly encourage you that if you are in need of anything, whether just to talk or to pray, um, we'd like some prayer to give either one of us a call or your elder uh, at this time. Please don't hesitate. We'd love to connect with you. Um, a couple other things we want to make note of before we begin the actual worship service is that we want to keep our communication lines open with you as best as we can. Perhaps you've already seen the video that we put out yesterday on Thursday. It's going to be just a, a few minute clip uh, sending words of encouragement to you. And that's going to happen on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So Pastor Daniel and I are going to be taking turns doing that. And it looks like it's been well received and we're thankful that it's already been a blessing to you. So that's Tuesdays and Thursdays. We're also going to be sending out to you on Fridays still the Connect and the Worship Bulletin. Now, they're going to definitely be abbreviated. There's not as much stuff going to go in there. But again, it's a way for us to keep connected with you. Along with that, you're going to see a children's activity sheet. And that's going to be emailed out with uh, the Connect and the Worship Bulletin. So keep your eyes open for that. Um, print it off if you can. That would be great for your kids to have, even during the time of worship on sun, uh, when we do worship together. We also have a Facebook page. Um, type in Drayton Reform Church. And if you're not signed on to the page, you can basically, I think it's a sign up, click. You can click on sign up and you can join the Facebook page. That's where our videos will be posted as well. We have a YouTube channel. And finally, in terms of communication, there are a lot of people that receive the email during the week, but some of you don't. And we want to offer an opportunity to you to receive the Connect and the Bulletin and whatever else communication there is um, with your email address. So please connect with Kelly. Send her an email and ask her to put you on the email list. One other note we want to share with you is that the deacons shared with us earlier this week um, an encouragement. And that encouragement is to remind us that while we are in this time of social distancing, um, the church's expenses largely continue without much change. And so... In that note they shared with us, which I'd like to just cover and summarize real briefly, is that they are providing a way for the church to give uh, through already a pre-authorized way. It's called pre-approved remittance. And there was a form that was placed in your mail slots. We wanna encourage you to take advantage of that. Um, if you need help completing the PAR form, uh, you can call Doug Dumering. He is the deacon chairperson. Or Alyssa Kroll. Um, she looks after the general budget for the deacons. You can also drop the form off along with a void check at the church. You can mail it to the church. Or you can scan a copy and send that to uh, Doug Dumering. And his email is all found, or their emails are found in the phone book. Another way to send your offerings in is to send a check 
to the church by mail to Drayton Reformed Church, making sure that uh, it is attention to the deacons. And finally, the deacons want to present an opportunity for you to come by the church and drop off your offerings or par forms. And that will take place uh, this morning, actually, at 10 a.m. Uh, till noon or tonight from 7 till 8 p.m. And so that will be on uh, today, which would be March the 23rd. Again, if you, um, I, I'm just going to read briefly this note to make sure I have this right. Um, the deacons are going to be available to receive your power form as well as your offering. Please remember to bring a void check along with your power form. Um, <clears throat> and they will be observing the recommended social distancing me measures. Um, we want to encourage you to use the wheelchair door buttons to avoid touching the doors with your hands. I think that's it for announcements, fairly lengthy, uh, but we feel those are some important announcements to connect with you so that you're kind of up to date. Now, as we go into the service, um, we really appreciate the feedback that we received from last week's service. Uh, as Pastor Danny and I were hunkered downstairs in the, in the youth room, what we've done for today is we've added some elements. Uh, we've added a couple songs. So Marianne Tinholt and Gwen Poot are going to be accompanying a couple songs. Uh, one of them is a children's song. I'm going to be given a children's moment. Um, some prayer times that we're going to be including. And of course, the message as we continue this series, um, Words of Life from the Cross. At this time, we're going to begin our worship, and I want to invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, it's good to come to you knowing that you are ready and willing to hear from us. And so we come to you with a heart to worship you. We are comforted knowing, comforted knowing that your eyes are watching over us, that your ears are tuned to our voices that your hand is guiding us. And we say with confidence that Christ is with us. Christ is before us. Christ is behind us and Christ is within us. Christ is beneath us. Christ is above us. Christ is in the quiet. Christ is in the storm. And Christ is in the uncertainty. And so we worship you in the confidence of the steadfastness of God our rock, in the confidence of the love of Christ that will not let us go, and confidence of the spirit of hope who gives us peace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hello and welcome to worship. God is calling us to worship in all circumstances and in all places. And we remember the words of Psalm 95. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Come, let us come before him with thanksgiving and sing joyful songs of praise. Please join us in singing this song.
So this is the time that we're gonna have all the uh, ages three to grade three come on up to the front of the church. So why don't you make your way up to the church? We'd love to see you. Yep, you come from the top, the balconies. Oh, sorry, wait a minute. That's what we're used to doing on Sunday mornings. And actually, I'm missing that. I'm missing seeing you all uh, come up to the front. But I am so glad, boys and girls, that uh, we can still have children's time. And uh, even if we can't be together for the next little while, I'm pretty excited that we can still do this and, and connect with you. Isn't it neat that we can still have church this way? You're likely watching this either with your siblings or with your parents. And this is just a pretty cool way. And um, although it's so much better if I could see you up close and in person, I'll tell you that. But this is the next best thing. So Mrs. Marianne and Mrs. Gwen, they just sang a song, right? Uh, he's got the whole world in his hands. Did you know that it's a song that I sang when I was your age? Do you know how many years ago that was? That was eons. Like we're talking, no, we're, don't worry. Don't even guess my age. Uh, that's a secret. That's a secret. That's okay. Pastor Daniel knows my age, but just don't ask him that. Um, it's what we call an oldie but a goldie. You know what an oldie but a goldie is? An oldie is, is a song that was sung a long time ago, but it's such a good song, we still sing it today. Like it's precious, like gold. And so we call it an oldie but a goldie. He's got the whole world in his hands. Now I'm wondering if you could help me out. I'm going to read some verses from the Bible. And I'm wondering if you could repeat after me. I'll make sure to go slow enough so that you have time to repeat what I've just said. So here it goes. Please repeat after me. For the Lord is the great God. the great king above all gods. Now you can repeat after me, for the great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. We're not finished. I'm going to, I'm going to, oh, you don't have to repeat after that. Just kidding. Here it goes. Ready? The sea is his, and for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. Psalm 95, verses 2 to 5. Great job. Great job. Now, I have another job for you to do. I'm going to read those verse, Bible verses again. And what I'd like you to do is to count how many times I say the word hands. Count how many times I say the word hands. Ready? Here we go. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land now here's the question how many times did i say the word hands did you get the answer all right here it goes i'm going to put up my fingers that this is how many times i said the word hands two pastor daniel got it right too yeah no, he was counting along with me. I'm very proud of Pastor Daniel. And I'm proud of you that you got this answer right too. Now, why don't you just give your, your folks an elbow bump, okay? No, no hand, no hand high, just, just elbow bump, okay? All right. Do you know that God created the world? And, and do you know that everything belongs to him? It's pretty amazing. Now, I want to teach, I want to teach you a word for today. And that word is the word one. Can we say it together? One. That's very good. Incidentally, I feel like I'm on Sesame Street right now, but I'm, I'm not. Don't worry. Um, I'm not. Okay, are you ready? Here it is. It's the word one. Let's say it together. One. Now, I want you to hold up one finger. 
And when I say the word one, you hold up your finger. So here it goes. We're going to go. Let's practice. One. Great job. Okay. Point your finger. Not your pinky, but your pointer. One. All right. Now, back to that song, he's got the whole world in his hands. It talks about how God has made uh, the mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and babies and animals, sun, moon, wind, rain in his hands. And in the Bible, it tells us that Jesus prayed for all of us to be one. You got it. To love each other and accept each other as God does so that we would have unity or be one. Good job, Pastor Daniel. So what does this mean? I think it means that God created one world. How many? Oh, oh, did you miss that one? You missed that one. I think it means that God created one world. How many? One! He didn't create different worlds for different people. He created one world for lots of different people. And Jesus prayed that we would act like one. How can we do that? Well, one of the most important... Ah, got you there. Pastor Daniel didn't even get it. Well, one of the most important things we can do is to love everyone. This is the country we live. Now, I want to show you a couple pictures. I think this is kind of cool. Let's see if we can see that. Pastor Daniel, does that work? Okay, good. So he's got the whole world in his hands. See all those little hands there? That's kind of cool. Somebody drew their hands, but that's a lot of hands, right? I got another picture for you. I think this is kind of cool, although the, the world looks like an oval, but don't worry about that. That's pretty cool, eh? Right? The hands in there, that's kind of cool. And there's another one, too, is I don't know how they do this, but here are two hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. That's pretty neat. And this, is, this picture here is from space, right? And uh, we get to see the earth of how it's in God's hands. And so we just wanted to share with you that the whole world is in God's hands. And um, I just want to invite you to pray with me. And in our prayer, you're going to fill in the word one, right? That's our word. I'll let you know it's, it's your turn by stopping. So when I stop the prayer... That's when you're going to say the word one. Okay, let's pray. All right, fold your hands, close your eyes. All right, God, help us to love. And that's where we put one. One another just like you do. And thank you for making our one awesome, incredible world. Help us to be one in Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. It's been awesome. We're going to see you next week. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another video sermon. Uh, in our worship, we're tracking along with the seven words or the seven statements that Jesus made from the cross. That's our Lenten worship series. And um, to get all seven of these words or statements, you have to add up the accounts from all four Gospels in the New Testament. Um, Matthew and Luke, sorry, Matthew and Mark, for example, each only contain one of the statements that Jesus makes from the cross. And it's the one that we're going to look at today. And it's also, it's the darkest, the bleakest statement from the cross. But what I think you'll discover with me is that the other side or, or underbelly of this darkness that Jesus experienced is a word of hope and of assurance for us. So I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 27. I invite you to read along with me. And I'm going to start at verse 32 and read all the way up to verse 46. So Matthew 27, verse 32 through the end of verse 46. Hear the word of the Lord. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. 
There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots, and sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What a week, what a time to be looking at these words of Jesus. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Watching the news or listening to the news this week is enough to to put those words on our own lips. Restaurants are closed, schools are closed, Borders are closed, hospitals in many places are are full or or filling up and yet under-resourced. People are growing anxious. There's only one news story in our minds right now. What's happening with the coronavirus? And what's the impact on, on our state, on our province, on our country, on our economy, on our small businesses, on our health, on our elderly? A ministry colleague in Italy shared this on Facebook. There are churches in northern Italy that are being used as makeshift morgues. The decisions being made by medical professionals in hospitals are like wartime conditions. Treat people who have the best chance of surviving, given the limitations on equipment and personnel, and send the rest home. My God, my God, why? Things aren't at that level here in Ontario, and the precautions we're taking, like having church services online, are precautions in the hope that things don't reach that level. But we don't need a global pandemic to say, my God, why have you forsaken me? Tragedy visits all our lives. Sometimes all our efforts come crumbling to nothing. Our business or our finances vaporize. Our relationships collapse like a house of cards. A loved one dies an untimely death. Why? Why is the most incessant question, literally incessant, the question why doesn't cease? It's usually easier to answer what happened or when it happened, or who it happened to, where it happened, even how it happened. But the lingering question is why? In the Bible, the psalmists are well acquainted with this incessant why. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why must I go about mourning? Why, Lord, do you hide your face and forget our misery? Why, God, do you hold back your hand? And it's a psalm, 
It's Psalm 22 that Jesus takes up as a prayer when he is nailed to a tree. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22, verse 1. Now, Matthew has already set up events to get readers thinking about Psalm 22 before Jesus even opens his mouth. Check out these phrases from Psalm 22. Psalm 22 says, They pierced my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. In Matthew's context, the soldiers crucify Jesus by piercing his wrists and his feet. And Matthew writes, they divided up Jesus' clothes by casting lots. Psalm 22 says, all who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. In Matthew's context, it says, those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads. The teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. They said, he trusts in God, let God rescue him. So Matthew's implied reader already has Psalm 22 ringing in their ears before Jesus opens his mouth. They're thinking, these are details and phrases from that psalm. How's that one start again? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then they go on to read, about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22, verse 1. In this moment of Jesus' anguish, the intimate connection between God the Father and Christ the Son is severed. In this moment, Christ bears the sins of all humanity. Christ experiences absence, isolation, distance from the Father. And so, in the most real sense, Jesus is in hell, the absence of God the Father. In this crucifixion, we have the suffering of God in the humanity of Jesus, who was God made human. Jesus, in Jesus, God came down to the human level to suffer as a human for human sin. Elie Wiesel writes a haunting memory of his time in a Nazi concentration camp, watching a young man suffer and die. He writes, the death throes of the youth lasted for half an hour. Where is God? Where is he? Someone asked behind me. As the youth still hung in torment in the noose, after a long time, I heard the man call again, Where is God now? And I heard a voice inside myself answer, Where is he? He is here. He is hanging on the gallows. Here's how Christians understand this. Christ on the cross suffered the deepest human suffering. And so whatever suffering we encounter, we can have hope. Christ is there with us. Our Savior has gone through the storm before us. In fact, our Savior was forsaken by God the Father when he bore the weight of human sin so that we wouldn't be forsaken by God even when we suffer. When we suffer, we don't go all the way to despair. In fact, even Jesus, in his God-forsakenness, didn't go all the way to despair. He says, my God. This is anguish, but not despair. Even the cry of anguish is, is a cry of faith. My God. 
It's a cry from within the relationship. It says, even in my moment of isolation, of distance, you're my God. The relationship stays intact. This psalm, all the psalms, empower honesty in our prayers. Jesus praying this way invites complete honesty in our prayer. We pray our honest hurt, our honest anger, our honest sorrow from within a relationship with God. I remember listening to somebody teaching on the Psalms, and he highlighted some of these very bold, God, you've abandoned me kind of places that we come across in the Psalms. Parts that make good, proper Christians uncomfortable. Oh, you can't talk to God like that. And he challenged us to reflect. Do you see how the Psalms, these God-given prayers for us to pray, empower us to complete honesty with God? Jesus gives us an example to follow. He doesn't waver in faith. My God, he says. And that kind of honesty is, is healing. God can handle our real stuff. And squaring with God honestly about where we are will deepen and strengthen and enrich our relationship with God. God would rather have us be honest with our struggles than superficial with our praises. And in fact... In our honesty with God, God moves us into genuine praise, genuine hope, genuine salvation from or in the midst of our struggles. That salvation for us is on Jesus' mind as he speaks the words of Psalm 22. Jesus knew this psalm by heart. It spoke to his experience. They pierce my hands and my feet. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. That's Jesus' psalm on Good Friday. And when Jesus cries out the opening words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Bible invites us to track with Jesus' thoughts through the words of that psalm, the words that are going through his mind as he hangs and dies on the cross. Psalm 22 starts in anguish, but where does it end? It says, God has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. Then the psalm expands, all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him, for dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship all those who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. Psalm 22 moves to God's salvation for all nations, all the peoples of the earth, and not only all nations, but all generations. Future generations will be told about the Lord, declaring to a people yet unborn, He has done it. That's the love and the promise that keeps Jesus on that tree. The promise that through His sacrifice, his God-forsakenness, God's love, is going out into all the earth, all times and places. The Heidelberg Catechism says, Nothing else could pay for our sins except the death of the Son of God. The Belgic Confession says, For it is written that the punishment that made us whole 
was placed on the Son of God and that by his bruises we are healed. So he paid back what he had not stolen and he suffered the righteous for the unrighteous in both his body and his soul in such a way that when he sensed the horrible punishment required by our sins, his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. He cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he endured all this for the forgiveness of our sins. You see, we, me and you, although we can sometimes relate to Jesus' prayer, God, why have you forsaken me? And we sometimes feel that. The truth is that when we look at our lives and the wrong we've done, and the people we've hurt, and the mess, and the sin, we should actually reverse Jesus' prayer and say, my God, my God, why have you accepted me? And the answer is Jesus' suffering and death, where Christ achieved the forgiveness of sin once and for all. Jesus became victorious over sin and death. He experienced the depths of hell by being forsaken by God. And Jesus became the victor, not only by dying for sin, but by rising back to life. He defeated death itself. And God extends the victory of Jesus to all God's children by giving them life in Jesus' name. To put it really simply, Because Jesus Christ was forsaken by God, we aren't. Not ultimately, not like Christ was. There are still nights when we cry, why? But God invites us to take those questions and those longings and those hurts and to carry them to the cross of Jesus and to remember that we're not alone. We're not forsaken because the forsaken one became the victor, and through him, God invites us in. And when the victor comes again, every tear will be wiped away. He will heal all our diseases, and all things will be made new. God invites us to hold on to that promise, that hope, when times are uncertain and feel chaotic, as they often do, as they do now, Because of Christ's victory on the cross, nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God or hold Christ back from fulfilling his promise. Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word of strength and hope when we feel weak and hopeless. Still our anxieties, calm our fears, Fix us on the hope that comes from outside ourselves, the hope of your love, your grace, your salvation. Help us not only to live in this hope, but also to live out this hope. In Jesus' name, amen. We just want to invite you to to pray uh, with us as we lead um, you through the prayers of the people. Let's join our hearts in prayer. Lord, we recognize that this is a time of uncertainty and distress. And we pray that you would sustain and support the anxious and fearful. Lift up all who are brought low, that they may have the comfort and we all may have comfort, knowing that nothing can separate us from the love that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Lord, you taught us to love our neighbor and to care for those in need as if we were caring for you. And in this time of anxiety, give us strength to comfort the fearful, to tend the sick, and to assure the isolated of our love and your love for your name's sake. God, you are a God of compassion, and so we pray that you be close to the ill, the afraid, or those in isolation. In their loneliness, would you be their consolation? In their fret, be their hope. 
In their darkness be their light. Through him who suffered alone on the cross, but reigns with you in glory, be their Lord. Lord, we pray for those who are ill. We entrust to your tender care those who are in pain, knowing that whenever danger threatens, your everlasting arms are there to hold them safe. We pray you comfort and heal them and restore them to health and strength. We pray for hospital staff and medical researchers. We pray you'd give them skill, sympathy, and resilience. We pray that you give them these things who care for the sick and your wisdom to those who are searching for a cure. Would you strengthen them with your spirit that through their work many will be restored to health through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We pray for our government leaders, for those who are guiding our nation at this time and shaping national policies, that they may make wise decisions. We pray for the Christian community that we would not be people of fear, but people of courage. We pray that we'd be people of generosity, who are giving and loving. And wherever we are, whatever it costs, for as long as it takes, wherever you call us, Lord, help us to be your people, your hands and feet. And Lord, now we pray for our own church family. We pray for those who are receiving ongoing treatments. We pray that their immunity would continue to be strong enough and ultimately that they might experience healing. We give thanks to you for those who have recently, recently had successful surgery. And we pray for the rest and full recovery. We want to pray, God, for your hand to be upon our elders and deacons as they provide leadership through this time for our church family. We lift up in prayer to you those living on their own or in nursing homes from our church family who will be receiving minimal to no visits during this time. God, be especially near to them. And finally, Lord, we know that there are things that continue on. We want to pray for our denomination as it continues to navigate the future. Would you continue to work with the Vision 2020 team as they meet together or remotely? And we pray, Lord, for your continual guidance and wisdom for our classes as well as our own congregation in the discernment process ahead. Father, we, we acknowledge, Lord, that we are in utter need of your care, of your love, of your presence. And so, Lord, as we go forward into this next week, whatever it might hold, we commit our lives to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So we want to just um, thank you for being with us today. Um, we want to just extend uh, the Lord's blessing to you. As we normally do at the end of the service, we want to extend the words um, of, of his word to you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.